We've been trained in to believe that we live in a world of scarcity when very much more accurate to say that we live in a world of material wealth. And the problem with that is if you think you live in a world of scarcity when you don't, then when you try to solve the problems you're facing, you tend to apply the wrong sort of solutions because you misunderstand your situation. We don't live in a world of material scarcity. We live in a world of material abundance, indeed superabundance, is a very much more accurate way to think about it. Tonight, I want to do the same process, again, is to look at the origins of our notion of individuality and our concepts of the community and how we've sort of essentially gone a long ways with individualism and individual liberty, which we think of as a good thing, um, and that what we've been trained up with our inheritance from the Enlightenment, I'm very pro-Enlightenment, but our inheritance from the Enlightenment now misleads us. Um, individualism, individual liberty is not a solution to the problems that we face, and hopefully you'll see why that is as we go forward. And the concrete example, I'm going to use many examples, but the one I want to start with is uh, student loans. Currently in the United States, student loan debt stands at about 1.5 trillion. That's kind of an impressive number. Um, so a lot of students working for a lot of tips to pay that off for a while. Um, about $150 billion of that is in delinquency. So that's, it's either, it's either delinquent or outright just not being paid. So that's kind of good. And that debt is held by 44 million mostly young Americans. And everyone knows this is a problem. Everyone knows, in fact, this is a growing problem. It's one of those problems, if you look at the chart, you know that at some point it ceases to function, right? It's just, it can go on for a long time. In fact, history shows you things like this can go on for an amazingly long time. But eventually, it all collapses. It just reaches some point uh, at which it is no longer sustainable. It all falls apart. And yet, for some reason, and for the reasons we're going to talk about tonight, we just can't seem to figure out how to solve this. It's very easy to solve. All we have to do is rethink our concept of individual liberty. That's the hard part. Right. So first, where does this come from? To understand the individual community, you must understand that communalism, the idea of the community, is essentially goes all the way back. Humans cannot live on their own. We are not made for isolation. In fact, isolation kills us. If you look on the back of, of the little handout there, <clears throat> there's a great quote. <clears throat> Several studies have been done on this. This is just the handiest quote I could come up with. In an article in the Harvard Business Review, Dr. Vivek H. Murthy, former Surgeon General of the United States, wrote, loneliness and weak social connections are associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day and even greater than that associated with obesity. So it's better to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and be obese than it is to be lonely. At least as far as mortality is concerned. And generally for the quality of life, we know this is true, but it turns out it's not just our psychological or emotional perception of this. It turns out to be just kill us. Being lonely, being isolated, being alone is bad for your health. And that's because we're social animals. It goes all the way back. I mean, we, are, we, are, we come from social animals. Our, 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 our family tree of evolution comes from apes who are social animals. I mean, we've been social for a long, long time. And trying to isolate the individual, it has very negative impacts. Um, and so if you look at something like the com commune structure, by the way, that, that word dates from about 1000 AD. Um, of course, communal living had, had existed for long periods before then. But ar around the commune age, 1000 AD, feudalism um, is sort of starting to give way to isolated towns and large villages that started to join together to protect themselves from the predations of nobles and bandits and princes and all other kinds of things. So they formed, this is where the word commune comes from. It just means community, it means together. And so what people did is they said, look, we're safer. We have better economic, social opportunity. We have more liberty if we live together, because we're protected from outside problems. Now, that 
was great. In fact, it was true. This is where we get the free city states all over Europe. This, and this is not just a European model, by the way. This is why cities and, and, and small towns are formed all over, all over the world. But in the European model, this grows into actual free states where you had principalities ruled by dukes and whatnot. But in the middle of it would be like Frankfurt on Main, this sort of free city that had its own rights, its own rules. But what we're not used to um, and what we've broken with is the tradition. And if you look on the back there again, you'll see that while you gain protection and in fact greater economic opportunity um, and security than you would have if you lived on your own as a peasant or a smallhold farmer in the country, you did not have the following, the freedom of movement, freedom of marriage, freedom of education, freedom to spend the money the way you want, freedom to wear what you want, freedom of religion, of course, was out of the question. There's no press as we understand it now. Certainly you couldn't choose what to read. Uh, no freedom of conscience, no freedom of assembly, that was heavily regulated. No freedom of association, you could not associate with who you wanted to. There's no freedom of employment, you couldn't change jobs willy-nilly, this was not allowed. There's no free trade in any sense. You couldn't plant what you wanted. Usually these had villages or farms had ground around them that was farmed, of course, because these are agrarian societies. You could not just go and say, oh, I'm going to plant rye this year. No, this was all decided by the community, when it was going to be planted, who got to plant it, where they were planting. This was all shared. These were all decisions made by the community. Um, I mean, just everything was regulated and restricted. So, and this is pretty much what communal living has always meant. To be in the community meant you followed the rules of the community. You gained from having the opportunity to share in the community, which is necessary for us to thrive and be healthy human beings. The price you paid for that is with your personal liberties and freedoms. You handed over a lot of them to the rules and the guideline, the conduct of the community. What religion are you? Whatever religion your community is. If you don't like that religion, it's probably best if you just shut up. Otherwise, they will kill you, stone you, exile you. History is very clear on this. Remember, remember Socrates put to death because he was considered a threat to the community and because they thought he was introducing false gods. So even in Athenian democracy could not tolerate any sort of deviation that Socrates represented because they felt he was a threat to the community. This is the history of communal living. So states grow, they become more complicated, we get kings, we get the pope, we have rules and structures and all of this, and then we get the Enlightenment. Now, of course, this is a bit of an abbreviated history, uh, but if to understand <laughs> the core of the Enlightenment it is not that complicated in some ways, it was a long series of arguments that said, no, I should have the right to read what I want, think what I want, argue what I want, choose the religion that I want, associate with the people I want to, have letters delivered to people in foreign countries who might even speak a different language, good Lord. We demand it. You must give it to us. And this was demanded against the church and the uh, kingly state. So the king cannot tell us we can't say bad things about the king. They can't censor the press. The church cannot say we can't have another religion or argue about church history. It's interesting, Shakespeare had to, Shakespeare wrote his, his great history plays and he had to stop writing his history plays because they passed some rules in Elizabethan England about, hey, let's not have any more of that history. Because the, our history, you know, may not be all that helpful in, in promoting the reign of Elizabeth. And so that's when he shifted to writing his plays that are set in Rome. Right? Oh, all of a sudden we get a play on Caesar. That's great. Because they can't kill you or imprison you if you do a play on Caesar. But they can if you do another play about an English king. And you get the history, quote unquote, wrong. <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, it, so, so he just stopped writing the history plays and shifted over to writing other kinds of plays. Um, because they, you know, narrow that in. You're not allowed to do that. Well, 100 years later or so, the Enlightenment comes along and says, no, look, 
we should be able to write the histories we want. Hume wrote a huge history of England. This is not uh, uh, disconnected that one of the great Enlightenment philosophers was also one of the great Enlightenment historians, Diderot. You know, they often had this mix of history, philosophy, interest in political liberty and ideals, because it was this freedom of conscience, freedom of expression. Um, and for us, the United States, we sort of hit the Enlightenment jackpot with our Constitution and the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. I mean, it was just written by John Locke. I just think they sent a letter to Locke and said, Dear Locke, would you write the Constitution for us? And he said, Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Knock myself out. And so, right, we all know it in theory. Um, but here it is again. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by the creators with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, what we miss here is that the entire history of governmental structures of the world demonstrates that that is not self-evident. In fact, this is the least self-evident thing there ever was. All men are created equal? No, almost the entire history of mankind was ruled by either an aristocracy that said they were better than everybody else, or by kings who said they had a divine right to rule, or by popes and other religious leaders who said they were talking directly to God and they, God told me to kick you. Right? The, the, the notion that everybody's created equal is absolutely nowhere in world history. No one thought this. The Greeks who came up with democracy, um, yay, but on the other hand, just half of, them, uh, half of the population is slaves. Uh, another 25% aren't citizens, so they can't do anything. Another you know, 20% don't have the property requirements to allow them to participate as citizens. So a good solid 10% of the men because, of course, women, whew, we're not going to talk to them. So, you know, it's just so all, no, nobody, not created equal, not self-evident, not inalienable, nothing, nothing, not a part of this was true. They just made this up. They just said, hey, we're going to say this because John Locke said it. We're going to go with it. Um, that to secure these rights, governance, uh, governments are instituted among men. No, governments were the problem. This is the shift you have to understand. The, the uh, uh, Enlightenment thinkers were arguing against their governments. And the titanic shift they pulled off, not just in political movements, the economic developments, but the, the shift that took place was governments came to be seen as the locus for guaranteeing individual rights rather than under kings and popes and bishops and emperors as the locus for the people who killed you if you tried to say anything or you stepped out of line. Right? Nobody in the Persian Empire thought, oh yeah, Darius, that guy protects my civil liberties. I don't think anybody ever said, Xerxes, he's the man. Asher Bonapool, he's the guy, he's freedom all the way, personal liberty, he, no. They're like, he's Asher Bonapool, Isser Hadden, his son, you know, they, they rule, and as long as you follow the rules, okay, if you don't follow the rules, they exile or kill you. It's perfectly clear in world history. And so this titanic shift happened. Part, by the way, it goes along with the shift to the nation state from other forms of the state nation and kingly state. Um, but uh, the key here is our liberties came to be seen to be guaranteed by this larger political structure. They weren't located in the commune anymore. What protected us from the king? The commune. What protected us from the robber barons? The city. How were we able to keep the aristocracy from robbing us? Well, you know, we'd form our militia or we'd fight back in, in our regional courts and we had, you know, had all of these local systems that you belong to. Our guild would help protect us. Our church would help protect us. Local, personal, regional institutions that you were a member of. But to be a member meant you followed the rules. You dressed the way they told you. You went to church when they told you. You had the job you were supposed to. If you were a member of a guild, you didn't get up in the middle and say, you know what, I'm joining another guild. I'm switching jobs. I'm done with this guild. No, it was, it was, it was sort of a lifelong membership program. And leaving it was no good. And, and particularly many of the guilds, like the glassblowing guilds, were under penalties of death because they had technological skills that people didn't want to get out. You know, so this was not, you know, trivial, trivial items. Um, 
And so this switch meant a lot of things, but for our purposes, it meant that our relationship to the community changed and changed incredibly. It took a long time for us to realize this. But now our freedoms, oddly and almost uniquely in the rest of world history, are vested, or we feel they're vested, in this large state structure that's very distant and abstract to us and not in direct relationships that are necessary for us to survive. The rest of history, you needed your commune, your family, your village, your city, 